This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. I'm Emma Keeling in London, finding out how a Soviet-era treatment could cure one of our most aggressive cancers. I'm Dr. Shinise Mara, and I've come to Cambridge to meet a company that's hoping to solve the Human Genome Project's diversity problem. And I'm Mark New in Sunnyvale, California, where scientists are turning carbon dioxide into fish food. Good morning. Good to see you. Richard Preston is living with an incurable brain cancer called glioblastoma. So Richard, you were diagnosed five years ago. Yep. And what did they tell you at the time? Bad news, you've got terminal brain cancer. It's malignant and it could grow back at any time. So um, within five days of the optician saying, there's something dodgy in the back of your left eye, I was in the operation room, having a six hour operation on my head. It's one of the most common types of malignant brain tumours in adults, and 70% of people diagnosed with glioblastoma die within a year. I'm Emma Keeling in London, where a professor is on the brink of a breakthrough using Soviet-era treatment once shunned by Western countries. Oncologist Dr Matt Williams says although brain cancers are rare, they disproportionately affect young people and are more often fatal, so their impact can be greater. So why are brain tumours so hard to treat? I don't really think we know all the answers. There are two obvious things. The first thing is that they're rare and therefore we don't get that many examples of them. But the second thing is the brain is a protected structure. So it's obviously protected by the skull, so it's difficult to get tissue. But even within the skull, the brain is insulated from the rest of the world by something we call the blood-brain barrier. And so actually most of the chemotherapy drugs that we give that might work for breast or lung or colorectal cancer just don't get into the brain. Throughout the body, there are small gaps between the cells which line the interior of blood vessels. These gaps allow ions and small molecules to pass from the blood to the surrounding tissues. But in the brain, these cells are closer together, even overlapping, which allows only nutrients, water and some gases to pass into the brain tissue, keeping out pathogens and toxins. Often brain tumours are regarded as kind of the poor cousin of other cancers. And so part of my job is to try and turn that around and say, actually, no, no, don't do it in breast, lung, prostate, and then come and look at brain. Come and work on brain, because if you can crack that, which is difficult, everything else will be a piece of cake. One of the researchers Dr. Williams spoke to was Professor Armin Hajitu. So do you remember that conversation with Dr. Williams? I do, it still sticks in my mind, especially when he described the, the poor, the very poor prognosis and the disappointing outcome for existing treatments. Professor Hajitu has been working for 12 years on a cancer treatment using bacteriophage therapy. Bacteriophages are the most abundant and diverse microbes found in the body, but the property that makes them of special interest is that they can cross the blood-brain barrier. A bacteriophage, or simply phage, is a kind of virus that only infects bacteria. Thousands of varieties exist, but each variety infects only one or a few species. The phage punctures the surface of bacteria, injecting it with its own genetic material. The bacterial DNA is then modified to manufacture more copies of the phage, which eventually kills the bacteria. The phage is able to recognise its prey by proteins, known as receptives, which are found on the surface of each species. In the 1920s, phage therapy was used extensively to treat bacterial infections. The discovery of antibiotics saw the treatment lose favour in the West, but Russia and Eastern European countries continue to study and use phages. This is what we call a tissue culture room in which we grow human glioblastoma cells. We grow them in order to test whether our phage can actually kill them before initiating the clinical studies in animals. So how long before you see any changes to the cancer cells once the phages have been added? With the first generation of viruses we had, 
it could take up to four or five days. But now with the superior, we have better viruses, it could take two days. We can start to see the death in cancer cells. Professor Hajitu and his team have genetically modified a type of phage, known as M13, to recognise receptors found exclusively on the surface of cancer cells instead of bacterial cells. They also edited the virus's genetic material to include a therapeutic gene which activates when injected, producing a protein that destroys the cell. Trials have shown that phages only attack the cancer, unlike chemotherapy and radiation that can leave the patient quite toxic. What am I seeing on the screen here? We are looking at a section from the brain of an animal which was implanted with human glioblastoma cells. This border between the tumour and the healthy brain, what you see in green here is the phage. This phage was able to cross the blood-brain barrier and accumulate in the tumours without harming the healthy brain. The treatment requires thousands of phages, so they must be harvested. As you can see, she has the phage in very small volume. That's all we have at the moment. But she just adds the phage to the bacteria. Each bacteria serves as a factory to manufacture, to produce the phage. So the more bacteria, the more phage will be produced. In that flask, we have a mixture of bacteria and phages. We need to get rid of the bacteria. The centrifugation will separate between bacteria and bacteria phages. And that's all phages in there? That's all phages. The phages are delivered into the test subject via multiple injections. A low dose of a chemotherapy drug amplifies the therapy by activating the immune system. We met Richard and he'd had his uh, tumour taken out, but there was a little bit left behind. So is that where your phage therapy would be used? Surgery by itself is not enough to remove the whole tumours. It has to be combined with other therapeutic approaches like chemotherapy, radiation therapy, in order to destroy the remaining cells. But in these cells you find what we call cancer stem cells, which are resistant to chemo and radiation therapy, from which the tumours grow back and lead to death of the patient. This is where our phage comes with this advantage because we show that our phage can find these cancer stem cells and destroy them. The other advantage of our phage is they can be given repeatedly without any safety issues, unlike other viral therapies or chemotherapy or, or other therapeutic agents. So how confident are you that phage therapy can cure glioblastoma? To be frank, only clinical trials in a human with glioblastoma will prove that. But we are optimistic. We hope it will happen. We have to live in hope. Clinical trials may begin in the UK within the next three to five years, but they could start even earlier in other countries. So your outlook on life is just very positive. I try and make it as positive as possible. I mean, I've, ha I've had the cancer, I've had, it, I've had it taken out, I've had the drugs. I'm just cru cruising along now, waiting for it to happen again because they say it's inevitable, it's going to happen again. So if you had the opportunity to take part in a clinical trial, to try something new, yes. would you take it? Yes. I've, I've already decided that anything I can do to help other people is worth me doing. Every story starts out like this. Okay. But beyond the rush of the numbers, there's always a more fundamental question. What happened? Who has been affected? When market moving decisions are made, who's responsible? And why? Let's get some reaction on ground. Joining us in Johannesburg is Sue Trinidad. Yeah. 
Hello, Nairobi. This well, is how all stories begin. See how they end. Only on Global Business. How will your world change today? What happens here? What happens there? Or what you make happen for yourself? If it matters to you, it matters to us too. Your stories are the stories that need to be told. Africa Live. Find your voice. It was in this very pub that Francis Crick and James Watson claimed to have found the secret of life. They discovered the structure of DNA. Since then, great leaps have been made in the sequencing and analysis of DNA, a field better known as genomics. In 2003, the first ever human genome was created. Genomics has come a long way, most famously with the Human Genome Project, which, whilst groundbreaking, may have a representation problem. 80% of all insights come from people of European descent, which means that there are millions of gene variations still missing. I'm Dr. Shilin Somara, and I've come to Cambridge to meet a company that's hoping to diversify genomics by traveling further afield to collect data. Deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA, is found in all organisms. It's made up of four chemical bases known as nucleotides. They are adenine A, guanine G, cytosine C, and thymine T. DNA bases pair up with each other. A goes with T and C goes with G, forming what's known as base pairs. There are three billion base pairs arranged along two spiraling strands, known as a double helix. Each of us has around 20 to 25,000 genes, which encode all of the characteristics that make us who we are. Genes vary in size from a few hundred DNA bases to more than two million. We know this thanks to the Human Genome Project. In 2003, scientists created the first ever genome sequence based on DNA samples from volunteers. This became the standard against which all other DNA sequences were compared. But it had one major drawback. 70% of the reference genome was based on the genes of just one man, while the rest came from about 50 other volunteers. Every person's genetic code is unique, so using just one reference genome, most of it from the genetics of one man, to stand in for humanity has introduced subtle biases into genetic research. Sumit Jamwa is the head of Global Gene Corp, which is spearheading efforts to diversify genomics by collecting biodata from India. He's based on the Wellcome Genome Campus, where the first ever human genome was sequenced. This captures the magic. The human genome. Absolutely. These 112 books contain the DNA sequence of the entire human genome, essentially what is the genetic blueprint for building a human being. So initially, the idea with the Human Genome Project was to create one reference human genome. And the work that you're trying to do is really drill down into the detail of the variations of that code contained in this set of books. That was the hypothesis. That was the reason why people went in with it and assumed that if once we have the reference genome, humans only have a small variation, so it should all work for us. And what we have realized over time is that each one of us is different in a slight but a very significant way. So if you were to read, oh, wow. what you see is basically a, a series of letters, A, T, C, and Gs, wow. arranged in a different way, which cuts across in a sequential manner. So much information, and this is just one book. If an average person started reading it, it would take them nine years to read one person's book of life. On an average, there are three million points where an individual is different from another person. And while may, that may not seem like a lot, it's actually very significant. 
in terms of driving and understanding and the risk that we are exposed to and put, putting that across, right? So you're absolutely correct. It started with a handful of volunteers and what we now need to do to achieve the promise of genomics is to understand what does a good look like for different populations that exist because it helps us understand what the risks are for that particular individual from that particular population but it also allows us to solve for different diseases on a global scale. What's going on in here with these huge machines? I mean it looks so impressive. And they are. I mean what you see here is these are some of the latest machines which are being used to sequence the DNA. And what you see there, if you look at the lines there, you know, the blue lines that are going across, that means that the machine, the sequencing is in progress. This site is one of the largest sequencing labs that exist in terms of throughput. But those machines are the latest machines that you can see, which are creating the DNA sequences to progress science that happens out here. Julia Wilson is an associate director of the Wellcome Sanger Institute, which was a key player in sequencing that first reference genome. So it took 13 years to get to the end of the project. Mission accomplished. Why do you need this institute and what are you doing now? Well, that was just the first. That was just one single human genome. We didn't even know what all those, we didn't even know how many genes there was until we'd done this. We knew there was three million bases. That's the letters of code, but we didn't know that there was 20,000 genes, what they did, how they worked together and what the differences are between individuals, some with disease, some without disease. And so this institute now sequences thousands and thousands of genomes to look for those patterns that could possibly remain obscure. Is it a real problem that the Human Genome Project is based on essentially one man and then a handful of other volunteers? Well, yes, and, and you know, we have to start somewhere, but now we see efforts to sequence um, different and more diverse populations. So there's efforts in Asia, to in Africa, and so it's important to be able to contextualise against a reference genome for those populations. Mm. Is there a massive difference between your genes and my genes? No, we're about 99.99% similar. Even though we're so, so similar, it's those small spelling changes that make the differences. Global Gene Corp are hoping to achieve genomic diversity by collecting DNA samples from across India. The man bringing together the data to achieve this genomic diversity for Global Gene Corp is Will McLaren, a chief bioinformatician. So India is particularly interesting. So uh, in our research, we've found that there is around four and a half thousand different ethnicities in India, which makes up a significant proportion of the ethnicities worldwide. So we see up here, this uh, pink and red area represents the South Asians. So the red ones are the South Asians as part of the Thousand Genomes Project. And the pink ones you see here are samples from our study. So if we were to just be focusing on what the Human Genome Project tells us, we would only be looking at this green blob here. Exactly. And there's all of this unexplored space outside of the green area here, um, which should become part of the global genome. So as a bioinformatician, what's your dream for the future of this research? Um, I would like to see making 70 the new 40. So we want people who reach the age of 70 to be in the same age of the same state of health that they are now at the age of 40 through this kind of advancement in genomics and science. Hello, I'm Stephen Cole. What's on your agenda this week? I know when it comes to news, you're sport for choice. So many channels, so many opinions. But it's time to step off the news roundabout, time to cut out the noise, get to the heart of the real story with a talk show with a difference. 
I'll be finding out what the world is thinking by talking to the global decision makers and helping you set your own news agenda. Remember, we don't just report the news, we set the agenda. The world's currencies are more connected than ever before. The mechanisms that drive the economy are universal. Money moves markets. We explain these trends and show you how the cash in your pocket can have a wide-reaching effect. Because money makes the world go round. Global Business. Today's carbon dioxide levels have reached heights never seen before in human existence. At the same time, aquaculture production has more than doubled every year since the year 2000, requiring 400 billion fish from already overfished stocks to be blended with grain in order to meet the needs of fish farms. But now there's a way to turn the tide on both problems at the same time. I'm Mark Dew in Sunnyvale, in the heart of California's Silicon Valley. The experimental science is happening at a company called Novo Nutrients. David Say is the CEO. Well, we're going to look at our sort of our mascots, which are these uh, small shrimp-like creatures that are called alternatively brine shrimp or artemia. Um, and they go by different brands. Probably the most famous brand is sea monkeys. But what we have here are actually... These are uh, these children's are children's pets. These exactly <laughs> like you, you can order things like these from the back of a comic book. I think still to this day, we're not feeding them the off-the-shelf feed that usually comes with them as a part of a package. Instead, we're giving them our prototype protein meal product. This is what the brine shrimp are getting: a specially designed mix of 13 species of microbes, known as chemoautotrophs or single-celled organisms, which feed on chemicals such as CO2. Under the right conditions, such as those provided by a Novo Nutrients bioreactor, they convert CO2 and hydrogen into more and more copies of themselves, just as a tree uses CO2 and water to make the cellulose and protein it needs to grow. Hey there, Mark. Nice, How are you doing? Nice to meet you. Nice what to you meet you. What you got going on here? Oh, I'm just uh, spinning down some cells that I uh, grew in this bioreactor over here. Founder Brian Sefton is the man who came up with the idea to capture carbon gases, feed them to lab-grown microbes that become protein to be fed to fish. Right here is an electrolyzer. So what this does is it takes water and it splits that water into hydrogen and oxygen. And we, we do this because in the laboratory, we don't like to store large amounts of hydrogen um, because hydrogen is flammable and can be explosive. So this produces hydrogen on demand. Over here, we're just doing two small scale experiments with gas fermentation that are right here. And these are very small, uh, small flasks that we're growing microbes in on a small scale to prepare for other, or to other experiments or to test. But the gas is going in here and the, the hydrogen is being produced on demand by that electrolyzer from uh, from electricity, using electricity as the power. And over here, we have, uh, these are tanks of carbon dioxide. We add a little bit of oxygen to it because these are aerobic organisms and that helps them get more energy out of the hydrogen. And that's the way our process works. Explain to me how hydrogen fits in. Uh, living things are mainly made up of carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen, okay? but. In the case of a green plant, for example, the green plant uses sunlight energy to capture the CO2 and split that carbon off and let the oxygen go and make the proteins, fats, and all the parts of the plant, right? And in our case, what happens is the microbes are able to use the same system that green plants use to capture that CO2 and use that carbon as a building block but instead of using sunlight energy, they use energy from hydrogen. So yeah, a very important part of growing microbes is 
uh, culturing them. And this, for example, you can see two different microbe strains here. This one is a, another carotenoid producing microbe that is very, very orange uh, in color. This one is producing a red fluorescence uh, protein. As Chief Technology Officer, Brian is continually mixing and growing things in order to find the right nutritional formula. One of the company's bioreactors is currently in the process of producing a brand new concoction. So what is that inside there? So this is one of our bioreactors and what I'm growing inside here is a bacteria. It's very, very orange colored and that orange color is actually, you might say it looks like carrots, that's uh, carotenoids which are an ex essential part of uh, nutrition for humans and for, for fish as well. And in fact, carotenoids are what give salmon its pink color. Now, are you growing this to become part of the fish food? I, I'm growing this to become a, a nutrition product and potentially to be used in the fish food. This is what it looks like when it comes out. It has a nice head on it like beer. When Brian puts it under a microscope, you can see what's going on inside. Nutritional value also boosts monetary value. The carotenoid is worth, the, the pure chemical, it can be worth two to eight million dollars a ton. But of course, this is only a small percentage of this. How good of a level can you get, right? And that's why, like I was saying, this is significant because it's so orange. Eventually, the microbes can be turned into a powder or a paste. I could taste this, actually. Yeah, I wouldn't do it, though. <laughs> it wouldn't be unhealthy, though, right? No, it wouldn't be unhealthy, <laughs> but it would probably be very bitter. Can you describe what a fish likes, what you found, or is that a secret? <laughs> well, to some extent, it is a secret, because these are attractants, and attractants are a very, very valuable area of formulating uh, uh, aquafeed diets. Nova Nutrients is more focused on growing a protein meal that other companies can mix with their own feed. They've already experimented with feeding their protein meal to trout, which had near equivalent growth and survival rates to trout that consumed ordinary feed. So far, Novo Nutrients has made their feed from carbon gases shipped to them from power plants and oil and gas companies. They've also used their own mobile lab to capture emissions directly from cement plants. Between now and the next couple decades, the total amount of aquaculture feed that will need to be produced could increase by 100 million tons a year. And where is the high quality protein gonna come from? Because you can't catch more fish to feed to fish. And there are many technical solutions, but few of them are economical. Something that's an inexpensive enough way to produce these proteins that can compete with catching fish before there's a real crisis and there just is not enough material to go around. Do you envision catching the CO2, you know, feeding it to your bacteria and growing food for humans someday? Yes, we think that it's a, the biggest challenge actually in many ways is consumer perception. We want people to be ready to embrace bacteria before we start trying to sell it to them. And so I think that the right path is for people to get used to things like the Beyond Burger or Impossible Meat. Right, things that are much more meat-like, but come from slightly novel sources. And so we think that you start with animals because fish, as long as it tastes good, they're gonna eat it, and then get to humans later, especially after that market has expanded. Today, it's still relatively small, but it's gonna be a multi-billion dollar, multi-hundred billion dollar market for uh, plant-based meats, and, and those can be our future customers. pressure from our laser when we focus all this power on a teeny tiny spot, you know, is enormous, humongous, like type of pressure will be something like 10 million Eiffel Tower on the tip of your fingers. But the power is very short. 10 millions of a billionth of a second, which is 10 femto seconds. I didn't even learn about the femtosecond at school. Yeah. So this is a yeah. new invention. This is where the lasers are. <laughs>